If I want love, and I'm trying to get it from my children, and they're being difficult, I'll go get it someplace else, because I want love. But if I want my children's love, where am I going to go? I can't get my children's love from the neighbor's children. So if I want my children's love, I really want my children, including their love. Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage. <laughs> Not true. Made for a nice little song, but it's not true. Love and marriage do not go together like a horse and carriage. Horse and carriage go together much better than love and marriage go together. It's shocking. But the thing that is ruining marriages all over the world is love. And we know this from our relationship with God. The rabbi said, everything is about relationships. Judaism is a relationship with God. And in that relationship, is it proper, would it be acceptable to say to God, I believe in you, I'll worship you, I'll obey you, I'll serve you, because I want to go to heaven. I want to get to heaven, to Gan Eden. Wouldn't be good? That wouldn't be acceptable? The Mishnah says, don't serve God like a servant who serves for a reward. Do it like the servant who serves without thought of a reward. What is so terrible about wanting to go to heaven. It's not a bad place. So imagine a man says to a woman, I love you for your money. And I want to marry you for your money. Bad? Offensive? Insulting? Most people say, no, if you're marrying for money, what's going to happen when the money goes away? What happens if, the, if she loses the money? Why do you think she's going to lose the money? Being so pessimistic. She has money. He loves money. A match made in heaven. <laughs> what's wrong with it? First of all, if you say, I love you for your money, it's not an honest statement. I don't love you. I love your money. Secondly, and this is really the ugly part, <clears throat> if he says, I want to marry you for your money, he's actually saying, is there an echo? Is it only me? I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <clears throat> if a man says, I want to marry you for your money, he's actually saying, can I just have the money? That would be the best. But nothing's perfect in this world, so if I have to marry you for the money, fine. It is so insulting. <laughs> and the same is true with Judaism. If I say to God, I'll, I'll serve you, I'll obey you, I'll do the mitzvot, I just want to get to heaven. It's like saying, if I could just get to heaven without you, that would be perfect. But no, right? Can't do that? Fine, so I'll do the mitzvahs. It's horrible. Here's the shocking news. Why is it better to say, 
I want to marry you for love. The money might go away. It's more likely that the love goes away. And also, if you say I'm marrying you for your money, it means I really just want the money. If I say I'm marrying you for the love, all I want is your love, not your opinion, not your personality. I don't want to hear your kvetching and your problems and your, just love me and shut up. <laughs> so I want to tell you what the problem is, serious problem. And it's not even about marriage, it's about life. I've been doing marriage counseling for many years, and uh, I kind of got used to the idea that uh, some men and women who are married to each other don't like each other. Shocking. They hate each other, so they need counseling. Kind of got used to that. But there's something new going on for the last couple of years Good marriages, successful marriages, people who have no complaints about each other actually say that they feel all alone in the world, individually. This woman is married, she has no complaints to the husband, the marriage is successful, the marriage is fine, but in a quiet moment, she feels like she's all alone in the world. This is not a marriage problem, this is a life problem. Because when you have that feeling, and it's a horrible one, your immune system crashes and you become vulnerable. It's, it's really a health hazard. In England, where they have socialized medicine and the government has to pay if you're not feeling well, they are desperate. They started a whole department in the Ministry of Health to deal with the problem of loneliness because it's costing them a fortune. <clears throat> you don't have to admit it, but there was a song back in the 70s. It was a very popular song. Piano Man. Yeah? <laughs> so there's a brilliant line there. It says, they're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. The problem is not loneliness, which you can share. The problem is aloneness. You can't share that. What is the cure to aloneness? Marriage. Torah says, therefore should a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and become one. It's the only relationship in which you are actually one. You have to leave your mother and father, even if you have a wonderful relationship, but you're not one with them, because they have each other. If they don't have each other, that's a whole different problem. But they have each other. You're number three, or four, or six, or 12. The only relationship in which you are one is marriage. <clears throat> so when marriage is not taking away that feeling, when marriage doesn't cure aloneness, there's something seriously missing, something fundamental. It's almost like it's not a marriage. Because marriage is supposed to take away that feeling of aloneness. 
And it could very well be the culprit is love. Because for the last 80 years, maybe more, actually since Tevya, <laughs> since Tevya's daughter introduced him to love, people have been getting married for love. Are marriages lasting? Are they stronger? Are they more satisfying? Hardly. And I think love is to blame. A man says, I love everything about my wife. Pretty nice claim. <clears throat> but something wasn't making sense because his wife wants a divorce. <laughs> so if you love everything about your wife, why is she unhappy? So I said to him, you love everything about your wife? He says, yeah. I said, do you love her? He says, everything about her. I said, yeah, but do you love her? He says, what about her? I said, not about her. Do you love her? He says, I don't know what you're saying. Thank you. I don't know what you're saying. If you take away all the things, what's her? It's like, like when people say, why can't you accept me for the way I am? Stop judging me, accept me for the way I am. I would gladly do that, but I don't know how you am. What does that mean? Who am you? <laughs> and if I ask you, you don't know either. Just, just me. What does that mean? What about you? No, not about me. So this, this has been an age-old problem. A woman says to her husband, I don't feel like you're really there for me. And of course, every husband says, what do you mean? Whatever you want. What do you want? Whatever you want, I'll do it. She says, never mind. <laughs> He said, what, what, what did you start? What was that? So men are sitting around saying, women just want to make you crazy. <laughs> she starts complaining about something. I tell her I'll do anything she wants. She says, never mind. <laughs> they just want to drive you crazy. And women sit around saying, men don't get it. And men are saying, get what? Never mind. <laughs> Men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Yes. And don't bother reading the rest of the book because at Gunnisht Helfen. <laughs> if you're from two different planets, forget about it. You're not going to understand each other. <laughs> so what are we doing? What are we doing? And the tragedy is even greater in that we're not educated at all. What were you told about marriage? What are we taught? Get married, have children, live happily ever after. Thank you. There's a huge difference between things and people. Pornography is the objectification of people, treating people like an object, like a thing. A human being is not a thing and should not be treated that way. Love is a thing. You can have or not have. You can have more, you can have less. You can like it, you can hate it. It's a thing. If you marry someone for love, you are not married to the person, you are married to the love. And that's why if the love disappears, you don't know what this person is doing in your house. Who invited you? I just wanted the love.
So what does it mean to actually love someone and not something or many things? So let's look at some alternatives. What's more powerful than love? What's more valuable than love? In America, <laughs> nothing. Love is everything. In fact, God is love. Christian idea. But if God is love, then love is God. If you're worshiping his love, you're not worshiping him. So it's interesting that since we are the chosen people, God's favorite of all time, do you remember anywhere in the Torah where God says, I love you? Re review the whole Torah quickly. <laughs> See if you remember anywhere where it says, I love you. Once in passing. The rest of the time, <laughs> he can't tolerate us. <laughs> you're impossible, you're difficult, stiff-necked, argumentative. <clears throat> What is more powerful than love? You see, love is not in itself important. The way it really works is that when someone is important, you ought to love. It's the right feeling for the people who are important in your life. So for example, big mitzvah to love God. See how important love is? No. You see how important God is. So why should you love God? He's already important in your life. What are you going to do? Might as well love him. He's not going anywhere. It's a mitzvah to love your fellow Jew. See, love makes the world go round. No. Jews make the world go round. <laughs> Ask any anti-Semite. <laughs> so love is the proper spirit in which to conduct a relationship with those who are important. Those who are important that you don't love, they're still important. You know, you can hate your brother, but he's still your brother. <laughs> And those you love who are not important in your life are still not important. Love does not impart importance. That's, that's an arrogant concept. If I love you, you're important. When I stop loving you, you're nothing. Terrible. Love does not make things important. Otherwise, chocolate would be the most important thing in the world. You love chocolate, and it's still not important. So what's more powerful than love? Being mine. If you're mine, well, that's, that's everything. So Tevye asks Golda, do you love me? You remember? Can you hum a few bars? <laughs> she answers, hmm? do I what? And then she sings him a song. <laughs> 25 years I've washed your clothes and made your meals and is that supposed to be a joke? Like she doesn't know what love is? <laughs> he asks about love and she sings him a song about laundry. Actually, he's the uh, 
immature one. Golda is wise. And she says to him, do I love you? Am I giving you my love? For 25 years, you have me, all of me, probably including the love. I am yours. And then she concludes, if that's not love, then what is? So she's saying, there is something much more important than love. Love comes and goes by nature. It rises, it falls. But I am yours 25 years without a moment's interruption. So being yours is much more powerful than loving you. And that's why, again, surprisingly, unconditional love, there's no such thing. It's a monstrosity. Everybody wants unconditional love. It's a terrible idea. You tell your 11-year-old, I love you unconditionally. What does the 11-year-old hear? So I don't count? So it doesn't matter what I do? That's right. I will love you no matter who you are. Oh, so you don't know who I am? It is such a rejection. Very often you tell a child, I love you unconditionally, and the child will do everything he or she can to make you admit that you hate them. <laughs> One girl was talking about, we had a teenage program in the beginning of the summer. And one of the girls said, oh no, my mother loves me even when I'm bad. And I said, you haven't been bad enough. Try a little harder. <laughs> and by the way, when it reaches that point where a mother hates her child, it is the worst hate in the world. It's dangerous. So yes, it's rare, but it certainly can happen. So what is love? Love is a response. I'm reacting to you. If you decide I'm going to love you no matter what, you're not reacting to me anymore. It's not a relationship anymore. Love is supposed to be a relationship. So what is unconditional? What's unconditional is fact. I am your mother unconditionally. I will always be your mother unconditionally. <laughs> you know how unconditionally? I am your mother even when I hate you. <laughs> and right now I hate you but I'm your mother. That's much more powerful. I am yours, you're mine, that's never going to change. And that God does say about us. You are my people and I can't get rid of you, even when I hate you. And that's reassuring. There's another very powerful word, more powerful than love, and that is home. What, what, what is a home? The home is when you walk in to your home, you are where you belong. It's a very good feeling. Most of our lives, we're not where we belong. We're visiting, we're passing through. We're, we're not where we belong. When you come home, you're coming back to the place where you belong. Powerful feeling. And what do you do in the home? 
what you're supposed to be doing. At work, there's some doubt. It's very nice when you have a career that you know this is what you're supposed to be doing. Not everybody has that. And then who are you with in this home? The person you belong to. So if we put it in more personal terms, when you come home, there's no place else you'd rather be. There's nothing else you'd rather be doing. And there's no one else you'd rather be with. That's kind of heaven. That's what heaven feels like. When the soul goes back to being a soul, it's home. It's where it belongs. That's heaven. A soul that comes back to heaven but doesn't feel like it belongs, you know what that's called. <laughs> that's hell. You remember the raid in Entebbe? I mean, you've read about it. You're not old enough to remember. Terrorists hijacked an airplane in Air France, landed in Entebbe in, in uh, Uganda. There were 300 and some passengers on the, on the plane. They freed the non-Jews and kept the Jews hostage. The Israelis went in there, violated every international law, but miraculously saved every one of them. What did the soldiers say? After eliminating the six terrorists and only the Jews were left, what did the soldiers say to these hostages who had been there for a long time, sleeping on the floor, not knowing what their future would be? Spontaneously, instinctively, these soldiers said the most perfect thing they could have said. Perfect. They said, let's go home. Is there anything else more powerful they could have said? Imagine if they had said, we came to save you because we love you. <laughs> it would have been horrible. <laughs> it's like the Mickey Mouse song. Why? Because we love you. It was the perfect thing to say. Let's go home. So this is what home should feel like. Not, I love it here. I belong here. And if I'm where I belong, doing what I should be doing with the person that I'm meant to be with, what's not to love? So instead of saying, I love you, which could be a very selfish little sentence, because it begins with I, once you start with I, how good can it be? And if the last word in the sentence is you, <laughs> how good can that be? So it starts with I and it ends with you. Not nice. <laughs> Love can be very selfish. It is. Love can be destructive. Love can be nasty. Manipulative. If I love you, then you owe me. Or I own you. So instead, 
when you're in a really good mood, instead of saying, I love you, try saying, you, I love. You, I love. Guaranteed, if you start a sentence with you, it almost doesn't matter what follows. <laughs> you is so endearing. I? Not so much. Can you imagine a mother saying to her children, you don't love me? It's OK. You're not the only children in the world. The neighbor's children love me. And they're cuter than you. <laughs> no mother ever said that to her children. Because mothers don't need love from their children. They want their children's love, not love from their children. Yeah? Different? If I want love, and I'm trying to get it from my children, and they're being difficult, I'll go get it someplace else, because I want love. But if I want my children's love, where am I going to go? I can't get my children's love from the neighbor's children. So if I want my children's love, I really want my children, including their love and their money. A woman does not need love from her husband. You don't need love from your husband. That is a destructive, unhealthy thought. A man does not need love from his wife. That's greedy, it's selfish, it's unhealthy. You need your husband's love, not love from your husband. And in general, you don't need love. It's a PR gimmick. You don't need love. You're all grown up. So if you really need love, go home to your mother. She'll love you. And if she doesn't, <laughs> you got a different problem that marriage isn't going to solve. You don't need love. You need someone, not something from someone. And when you have someone who is yours and you create a home, of course you're going to love it. Maybe not today, not now. <laughs> but there will be love because there is what to love and there is reason to love. It's the icing on the cake. But the cake is the relationship, the marriage. So those of you who are thinking of getting married, the first thing you ask the person you meet, and it's never too late to do this even after you're married, you meet somebody, the first question you want to ask, the first thing you want to determine, the most important thing you need to know is, do you love marriage? Not do you love me. Everybody loves me. <laughs> do you love marriage? Because if you don't love marriage, I'm going home. There's nothing to talk about. In fact, I recommend that when you go on your first date, bring along a calendar. Open the calendar and point to a date. Like, what's today? Uh, August. Um, February. February 15th, I plan to be married. I've got it scheduled. Wedding day. 
open it up and show the person you're with. I'm planning to be married February 15th. If he says, of which year, <laughs> just go home. He's not serious. So when I say this to women, they say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. They'll run away. Exactly. Success. <laughs> you weed out the ones who aren't serious. If they run away because you really intend to be married, you don't want to waste time with them. On the other hand, imagine you take out your calendar and you say, I'm scheduled to be married February 15th. I've got it all planned. And he opens his calendar and says, look at this. I'm scheduled February 18th. You can negotiate that. A little compromise. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? So the first thing is, you do not marry for love. It doesn't make sense. A young couple come to me, they say, we're in love. We're very much in love. We would like to get married. I said, too late. You're already in love? What are you getting married for? For love. <laughs> You already have the love. What's the marriage going to do? It doesn't make any sense. First you love, then you get married for love. Don't get married. You already have what you want. Enjoy. You get married for marriage. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> you get married so that you'll be married. That doesn't sound like a good idea? Then don't do it. So if a man says to a woman, you know, I never really, I'm not the marrying type. I never really liked the idea. But you are so fantastic. You're so special. I'd marry you. Take the compliment, but not the offer. <laughs> Don't marry him. First of all, you're not that special. Secondly, if he's marrying you because you're special, you're in trouble. Because as, as soon as you're not so special anymore, it's over. Never wanted to be married. So the first thing is, marriage doesn't need justification. It doesn't need to be prettied up. Marriage is a wonderful, holy, powerful, civilized thing to do. You don't need to enhance it by calling it love. Like making love. Just a, a, disgusting expression. Making love? No, you're making a baby. <laughs> you know anything about biology? <laughs> you're making a baby. You're not making love. Why do we call it that? Because we think it's disgusting. What am I? You think I'm just having sex? I'm not an animal. I'm making love. Oh, well. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> Which I really never understood. If you think it's disgusting, why are you doing it with someone you love? Do it with someone you hate. <laughs> How does calling it love fix it? The truth is that if it's just sex, it does need to be prettied up. But if it's intimacy, which is what happens in marriage, nobody needs to enhance intimacy by calling it love. Because intimacy is more powerful, more holy, 
more real than love. So what does intimacy mean? Intimacy is the ability that people have to merge with each other through the process of elimination. When you eliminate and remove all things that come between you, you will become one. And the reason, if you need to know, the reason is because you were once one, and something separated you, something. Get rid of that something, and you will be one again. Like two drops of water next to each other on the table. Isn't water supposed to flow? How do you have two drops of water? What keeps them separate is the air, the air pressure. What is it called? Surface tension. It's surface tension that keeps the shape of the... Now, what will it take for those two drops to become one? Almost nothing. Touch it. Just break the tension. There will not be two drops. It will be one. If we remove the things that separate us, we are essentially one. Our souls are one because the definition of marriage is a reunion of two parts of the same soul. Not a union. Anyone can make a union. To men, to women, anyone can make a union and live happily ever after. But it's not a marriage. Marriage means a reunion which is kind of a miracle. God somehow guides the events that you meet each other, recognize each other, and are reunited. That's true of the soul. It's also true of the body. Because the Torah says, right in the beginning, that the first human being was male and female. Don't, don't visualize. <laughs> Take it on faith. <laughs> it was male and female. And that's a perfect human being. But then God divided them. And we think that's an improvement. Well, now we're normal. No. To be only male or only female is not a complete human being. So getting back together, when male and female become one body, one flesh, that's simply going back to our truest nature. So what will it take to go back to nature? Just stop interfering. Eliminate the things that come between you, and you will become one. One of the things that come between you Love, it's a thing. So most experts say, when you're choosing who to marry, see how many things you share in common. The more things you share in common, the more grounds there is for building a relationship. So if you both love pina colada <laughs> and walks in the rain, that's wonderful. No, it's not. You'll be married to a drink and to the habit of getting wet. You're not marrying each other. You're marrying the thing that you both want. And that will come between you. It will not bond you. It will keep you separate. Because you're both thinking about something, not each other. Intimacy means, including physical intimacy, physical intimacy means you simply merge. 
There's no thought, there's no performance, there's no objective, there's no goal, there's no judgment. If you ask your grandmother, what happens in the bedroom? What would your grandmother say? <laughs> Go ask your grandfather. <laughs> your grandmother would say nothing. And you say, come on, I heard something happens there. What goes on in the bedroom? And your grandmother says, nothing. She figured, OK, you're going to have to go ask somebody else, because she doesn't want to tell you. She actually gave you the only correct answer. What happens in a bedroom? Misleading question. It's a trick question. What happens in a bedroom? Nothing happens in a bedroom. It's just him and her. Who's the thing? Who's the what? There's just a who. It's him and her. Yeah, so what happens? Nothing happens. It's just them with each other. To make it really graphic, after being intimate, the husband says, so how was it? How was what? Uh, how was it? <laughs> there was an it in the room? I thought it was just us. There's a love triangle going on here. <laughs> Who invited an it? What's an it? And secondly, you're asking, you weren't there? <laughs> no, he wasn't there. You see, if it's not intimacy, it's sex. And sex separates. It does not bond people to each other. It's an it, and it comes between you. There is no it in a bedroom. Your grandmother is right again. <laughs> a bedroom is a no-thing zone. There should be very few things in your bedroom, just physically. A television in a bedroom is deadly. <laughs> I was mentioned to people. There are three partners in the birth of a child. The mother, the father, and God. But in America, it's Jay Leno, because he's always on. He's the it in the room. It's not good. Anything, any sound, anything you see, anything you're wearing, Anything you're thinking other than intimacy comes between you. So the sages were very curious about this one family, this one couple, who had amazing, unbelievable, perfect children. It was so impressive, the sages went to ask her, what, what do you do to make such incredible children? And she said, we are never intimate before 1 o'clock in the morning. They said, that's your secret? <laughs> she says, until 1 o'clock in the morning in our village, there's activity. Somebody coming home late, somebody doing some work. So you hear a horse go by, you hear a door open or close. After 1 o'clock, there's no activity. So there's no possibility of a sound distracting us. Which means that when you're being intimate and you're conscious of a sound outside, you've ruined it. There is something in the room. So lately I've been running around peddling the book. So I get to go on podcasts and all the other couple of television shows. 
And some of the interviewers are like the furthest thing you can imagine from anything um, modest, edel, traditional. And to talk about intimacy, and they say, what's a practical suggestion that you can give people? I say, never be intimate with the lights on. <clears throat> Always in the dark. And these people who you would never expect it from them, they're like, wow, yeah, dark. <laughs> Do you remember all the old shows, I Love Lucy and all the rest? When they were going to be intimate, what was the last thing they did? Turned off the lamp from their separate beds. <laughs> they turned off the lamp and you knew they're going to be intimate. And that's not because of television censorship. That was the normal behavior in all of America. When you're intimate, it's in the dark. That was the norm. Who changed it? Who introduced having the lights on? Pornography. Because it's hard to take pictures in the dark. And now it has become mainstream. But if you just think about it for a second. Dark, so you see no thing. Quiet, you hear no thing and you say no thing. Keep things out. What are you going to be left with? Each other. That's intimacy. If you're angry at each other, don't even try to be intimate. All the experts say, if you're angry, be intimate. You won't be intimate. You'll be doing something. You won't be there for each other. If you're a little tipsy, don't be intimate, because you're not present. If you're not fully awake, don't be intimate. You know, you know the, the Me Too business that's going on? Yeah, you know, men are not nice to women, they, whatever, right? So women are objecting. Now, some people say the problem is men don't respect women. We have to do something to get men to respect women. That's true. But that's an old problem. And some of the men who were found guilty or accused of, uh, of misbehavior, they do respect women. They do. Others say that the problem comes from the abuse of power. If a man has power, he'll abuse it. Well, so will a woman. The abuse of power is also an old problem. Today, we're experiencing something else. Back in the 60s, men and women decided that intimacy deserves no respect. Free love, free. Free of what? Free of responsibility, free of commitment, free of seriousness free of meaning, free. And it sounded like a good argument because so many people were uptight and, 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 and incapable of anything romantic. And, and they said, relax. It's fun. Have some fun. What are you getting so uptight about? Men and women. So what we have lost is not the respect for women. It's the respect for intimacy. 
Intimacy is awesome. You never get arrested for loving somebody, even if it's inappropriate. You can easily get arrested for intimacy that is inappropriate, because it's much more important, much more powerful. So the respect for intimacy which the Torah gives us adds to the respect for women. It makes the whole relationship respectful. So let me end with this story. I was a teenager, and I'm standing, if you read, doesn't anyone blush anymore, you know the story. I'm standing on the street in Brooklyn, on Kingston Avenue, talking to one of my favorite teachers, a brilliant man who you ask him a question and he understands the question better than you do, and he gives you an answer that doesn't leave any room for doubt. So I love talking to him. As we're talking, this newlywed couple approach the rabbi, because he's also the rabbi of the community, and the wife says, Rabbi, isn't it true you're not allowed to ladle soup out of a pot on Shabbos? Tell my husband, he doesn't know. And this rabbi says, wait, wait, slow down, slow down. What is your question again? She says, are you allowed to ladle soup out of a pot on Shabbos? He says, you mean like with a ladle? She says, yeah. Out of a soup pot? Yeah. On Shabbos. <laughs> While it's on the fire. That's really complicated. I have to go home and look it up. Call me at home later, I'll tell you. And they walk away. I'm staring at him like, <laughs> am I missing something here? Every kid in Cheder knows you're not allowed to cook on Shabbos. Stirring the soup is cooking. In fact, in some recipes, it actually tells you how many times to stir. I always wonder, it says, stir 50 times. What, what if you forgot and did it 51 times? <laughs> You have to throw the whole thing out? So stirring is an actual act of cooking. So if you ladle soup out of a pot, you're stirring the soup. You gotta take it off the fire. So I said to the rabbi, I said, what, what's so complicated? Why didn't you tell her she's right? And he says, and make her husband look bad to her? You're not allowed to do that. That made such an impression on me. Because he did it so instantaneously. Just went into this dumb mode. <laughs> like, wow, <a> complicated question. <laughs> the respect for marriage. The respect for intimacy. We got to get it back. It's an awesome thing. So partial intimacy, half-hearted intimacy, absent-minded intimacy, don't do that. Have respect for intimacy. It's got to be right. It's got to be whole. And again, it means eliminate all things. Anything can get between you when you're supposed to be merging and becoming one. The tone of voice you use at home, be careful. We were growing up, there were years, there were eight of us, there were years where we didn't know our mother's first name. We would never call her by her first name. And my father never called her. When he wanted to speak to her, he would go to where she was. He would never call her from the other side of the house. 
So when I heard people doing that, it was, it was disturbing. You summon your wife? And some actually say, and if you're guilty of this, I'm sorry, people actually say, get over here. That's how you talk to a spouse? That's not the right tone, it's not the right words. Shouldn't even say that to your children. Well, maybe, okay. <laughs> you can say it to your children, not to, not to each other. You want to say something, have the decency to go to where the other person is and talk. The Rebbe of Kotsk was a very intense person. Always, always looking for the absolute honesty and truth. And people thought that he didn't know his chassidim very well. They were very surprised when he described one of the chassidim with great insight into his personality, into his emotional makeup. So they asked the Rebbe about another chassid. And he described the other chassid with great insight. Finally, they asked him, what about your son? He says, do I know my son? I know with which thoughts I invited him into this world. That's another story that blew me away. When you're being intimate, the child that results feels invited. But when you're busy with something, if you're distracted by something, if the intimacy has become a performance and you're self-conscious about it, the child doesn't feel welcomed. You got to reassure the child after he's born. Yes, we wanted you. We're glad to have you. Not like this comedian who says, I had such a sweet little boy, and then he became a teenager. And now he's got issues and attitude. And we get into a lot of fights. And one day, this teenager said to his mother, so why'd you have me? So she says, I told him, uh, we didn't know it was going to be you. <laughs> we were hoping for a guy with a job. <laughs> what makes a child feel welcomed into the world? Intimacy. When you remove all things, the child is not blocked. So, how do we get the power back into our marriages? The wow. And wow doesn't mean frivolous fun. It means the awesomeness that marriage is supposed to be. That which creates a home that feels like heaven. So when you walk in your front door after a day at work or whatever, look at the mezuzah. The mezuzah on your front door says, you are now entering heaven. Out there, eh, whatever. But now, this is where you live. Outside, you just exist. The house, the home, that's, that's where life happens. <laughs> Don't say to your teenage daughter, you can't go out dressed like that. <laughs> no. If she's not dressed properly, tell her to get out. You can't stay in the house dressed like that. Because this is a home. This place is heaven. Here, everything is wonderful. If you don't want to be wonderful, do it outside. Why is the street more important than the home? 
Why will you go to the, why will you run around in the home not dressed properly with each other? But if the doorbell rings and some guy's delivering pizza, you get decent. And with each other, you don't have to be decent. You have more respect for the pizza delivery guy than for each other. Don't do that. You got to upgrade the relationship. The more refined, the more respectful, the more dignified, the more elegant, the less things get in the way. Get the television out. Keep the computer out. Don't have a desk to do a little work before you go to sleep. Keep the bedroom like your grandmother's bedroom, a no-thing zone. The children will benefit greatly. Your marriage will benefit greatly. The community will benefit greatly. And maybe we'll have a healthy, normal society. Because I don't know if you've been listening to the news. We're in trouble. Something is desperately wrong. You know what I'm talking about. It's out of control. And for no reason. For nothing. So we need to upgrade. And you got to do it together. It's got <laughs> to be mutual. So plan. We upgrade everything else. We want to improve everything else, but we take our marriage for granted? Shouldn't be. So every time we come back from shul, for example, we should be a better husband. I mean, what else did you accomplish by going to shul? <laughs> At least that, right? Every time we learn a little Torah, you become a better wife, you become a better husband. It really is worth every effort because we can't be alone. Can't. So we should all have good news. Our marriages should be the healthiest, the strongest, the happiest, and then the most loving, because you have so much to love. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. Have an easy fast. <laughs> you have some questions? Yes? Okay. Um, people submitted them anonymously. One at a time. So, so we'll start with um, which spouse is meant to initiate in a healthy marriage? Which spouse is meant to initiate in a healthy marriage? The more aggressive one. No, no, no. It really should be the man. If you want to know what a healthy relationship is between a man and a woman, and that too has become so ridiculous, we don't know what male and female is anymore. I was speaking with a group of rabbis. We're talking about continuity. And they were saying, you know, they gotta change this, you gotta change that, you gotta... I said, whoa, wait, we're talking about continuity. Don't make changes. Continuity means you do what your grandfather did and what his grandfather did. One of the rabbis said, how can you ignore 50% of the population? So what did I say? You said grandfather. Why didn't you say grandmother? <laughs> I said, you're so behind the times. How dare you assume that my grandfather was a man? <laughs> and she had nothing to say. That's how crazy we right? Here's what a good, healthy relationship means. For those of you who are getting married, 
you need good chemistry. Good chemistry means exactly precisely this. The woman is sitting with a guy, and for some strange reason, she feels so comfortable with her femininity. That's good chemistry. The guy is sitting with a woman. Usually he's a little tense, he's a little self-conscious, he's a little competitive, he's a little worried what she thinks of him. With this woman, he feels so comfortable being a man. That's good chemistry. She brings out the man in him, he brings out the woman in her. And what does that look like? What does that sound like? He's thinking, I want to take care of her for the rest of my life. And she's thinking, this guy, I would support him and follow him in anything he wants to do. That is good chemistry. But when a woman calls and says, I'm going out with this guy, he's such a nice guy. I've never seen anybody. He's so gentle, he's so respectful, he's so sweet, he's so thoughtful. I don't know why I'm hesitating. I know why. You should adopt him, not marry him. <laughs> you want to mother him. He's so sweet. A guy calls and says, I'm going out with this incredible woman. I've never met anybody like her. She's smart, she's capable, she runs the whole company, the whole organization, she's the life of every party, she's good at everything. Why am I hesitating? <laughs> I know why you're hesitating. She doesn't need you. You have nothing to offer. She's smarter than you, stronger than you, more capable than you. She doesn't want a puppy. She wants somebody she can lean on. That's the male-female dynamic. The man wants to be the giver, the caretaker. The woman wants to be the nurturer, the supporter, the man-maker. So if you have that feeling on a date, after you've checked out all the vital statistics, if you have that feeling, you're just comfortable being a woman or you're comfortable being a man. It's not you doing it, it's the other. Some women will make a man feel like a man. And some men will make certain women feel like a woman. That's good. So you encourage your husband to be the initiator because that's what a man does. And if he doesn't, you tell him. <laughs> you know that joke about two lines in heaven? You know that? One line is henpecked husbands, and the other one is non henpecked. The line for the henpecked husbands is long around the block. The one for the non henpecked is one guy standing there. So they go over to him and they say, How'd you do it? How did you manage to stay? In on top of the relationship. He says, on top? I don't know what that means. My wife told me to stand here, so I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to do that. You always want to build up your husband. Listen, the worst thing you can say to your husband, they're not listening, just between us. The worst thing you can say to your husband is, never mind, I did it myself. <coughs> Sounds innocent. It's terrible. I know you can open the jar yourself. Don't. <laughs> I know you can take out the garbage yourself. Don't. So who should initiate? The man. And if he doesn't, Tell him to initiate. <laughs> Another question. Um, what advice do you have for older singles who are trying to date to get married? Same advice as for young people. It's just a little harder to make room for another in your well-established life 
in your set patterns and so on, habits. But it's the same idea. Work through a shatchan. Believe it or not, it is still a wonderful idea. Just the two of you? Not good. Not good. You go out on a first date, and within a half hour you decide, I don't want to meet this person again. But at the end of the date, the person says, so should we get together again on Monday? And you don't have the heart to say, no. <laughs> so you, nah, nah, yeah, OK. You're, you're getting in deeper than you want to be. It's uncomfortable. It should never happen. You go out on a date. You call the shatran. You say, I would like to see him again. And he says to the shatran, I'd like to see her again. Then the shatran says, there is another date. Otherwise, there is no other date. That way, nobody gets hurt. There's nothing murky. There's nothing confusing. There's no misunderstandings. It's really nice. Wait, we'll do one more. Uh, what advice do you have for couples who've been married for a long time to keep the spark alive? <laughs> the same comedian with the kid? says, people are always, I've been married for 30 years, she says, and people always ask me, what is the secret to a long, happy marriage? Well, I can tell you about long. <laughs> <laughs> she says, I made a vow till death do us part. I didn't think it would take that long. <laughs> You're married a long time. That's an amazing thing. You may not even be aware of how bonded you are with each other. On the surface, it may seem that there's been tension, there's been whatever. You've shared life for 30 years? That is awesome. You, you didn't bother to enjoy it. You didn't stop to appreciate it, but you have it. And that is really amazing. So celebrate it now. The oneness doesn't get old. Things get old. But a relationship doesn't get old. It only gets deeper to where you become so merged, you can't tell where one begins and the other ends. Instead of being the love of your life, you become the pleasure of each other's life. And that's everything. You can't be without each other. That's a good thing. That's success. So a long relationship is not a problem. It's a blessing. Just enjoy it more. If a child asks, will you always love me, what should you say? You should say, well, if you want me to. If you're lovable, I'll love you. If you're a nuisance, <laughs> then I'll be angry at you. But I'll always be your father. I'll always be your mother. Children actually want to hear that. They're not afraid of being scolded or being uh, disciplined, criticized. They're not afraid. They're afraid of abandonment. So you have to reassure them that you will never abandon them, even when you're in a bad mood. That's what they want to hear. They know they're going to be bad. They're not angels. They want to know what's going to happen when they're bad. And if you say, well, I'll love you anyway, Mm, that doesn't sound believable. And it's not. Children are not stupid. So don't play games. Talk to children like they're intelligent. Because today's children are. Be honest with them. <laughs> one last little story. 
A guy calls me from Israel. He's got a problem. His 12-year-old daughter got it into her head that God is angry at her. And nothing they tried helped. They went to psychiatrists, they went to rabbis, they went to Kabbalists, they went to voodoo, <laughs> nothing helped. So he calls me, I don't know him, and he puts her on the phone. So I said, God is angry at you? She says, yeah. I said, I'm so jealous. <laughs> she says, what? I said, you're 12 years old, and you can get God angry? How did you become so important? <laughs> Problem was resolved. <laughs> Why? Very simple. Everyone she went to told her a hundred times over, God is not angry. God loves you. It doesn't work. If a child has a certain feeling or a certain opinion or a certain fear, don't argue. A kid comes home and says, everybody makes fun of my nose. I have an ugly nose. You say, oh no, your nose is beautiful. Come on, don't do that. They're not going to believe you on this, and then they won't believe you on anything else. You say, your nose? Yeah, it's an ugly nose. I like your ugly nose. Don't argue. A woman was anorexic. She went through therapy. She wasn't in danger, but she says, I still find eating distasteful. I said, it is. She was shocked. I said, it's disgusting. It's animal behavior. Why do human beings have animal behavior? You see people eating? They're animals. And I went on and on. She said, you're worse than me. I said, look, God designed us. And for some reason, he built into the human being an animal need. I don't know why it's so humiliating. But what are you going to do? You swallow your pride, and you eat something. Problem went away. Again, because I didn't argue with her. If there's some truth to what she's saying, go with it. Why do you have to argue and dismiss people's feelings and people's opinions? And so with children particularly, if a child is saying, I I'm not sure you like me. Do you really like me? You say, oh, yes. I'll never trust you again. <laughs> say, you know, sometimes you really bother me. When you don't listen, it makes me really angry. And when you hit your brother, I don't like you. Other than that, you're OK. <laughs> then the child knows he's safe. But if you play games, no games. Your children will be grateful. So again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for listening. Partner with Rabbi Friedman. Visit itsgoodtoknow.org forward slash support.